Welcome to Dr. Mix. This is the list of the top 10 synthesizers of all time. You like synthesizers? You definitely have to be subscribed to this channel by hitting this button here and also hit that bell notification so that you don't miss out. Are you ready? Number 10, the Oberheim OB8. The OB-8 is the last one of the OB series and it followed other mega classic synths such as the OB-1, OB-XA and the OB-X. This synth is an absolute giant with a super warm sound and a very distinctive polyphonic portamento that you can recognize easily on the entirety of Michael Jackson's Thriller. In fact, this synth was used by some of the top pop artist at the time. Prince Van Halen, The Police, Paul McCartney, just to mention a few. Next! Number 9, the Roland D50. This is the first digital synthesizer I've ever owned and it was first released in April 1987. At that time, it was the only synthesizer to use samples and virtual analog architecture. That's why this sounded a lot more realistic than a lot of other instruments. You could do strings with this, like that. Right? Or you could have a uh, flute. Somewhat realistic. Okay, the Sakuachi. Everyone remembers this, but also some very luscious fantasy sounds like number 11, fantasy. You wanna hear a very famous one? 84, afterthought. <laughs> right? Yeah, the D50, baby. The D50 had a really cool look and it featured a pretty wide LCD display mounted on a slick metal front panel. This synth became ultra popular in the recording studio. It was used by Sting, Gary Newman, Enya, New Order, Phil Collins, Miles Davis. Along with the DX7 and the M1, the D50 shaped the sound of the 80s and the 90s, and it contributed to the shift of manufacturers' focus from analog to digital synthesizers. Next! Number 8, the Fairlight CMI. Made in Australia and released on the market in 1979, this monster was the first polyphonic digital sampling synthesizer. It was a mammoth of a synthesizer with 76 notes keyboard, a big main frame and yes, floppy disks, a green screen and a light pen to edit notes and sounds. The Fairlight also had a fully-fledged visual sequencer, which effectively made it the first commercially available music production workstation. Famously used by Herbie Hancock, Kate Bush, Peter Gabriel, Fairlight CMI is the most recognized for this sound. Come with me. I don't have a CMI, but I have that. That's from Arturia. You ready? Moments in love. Next, next, you should hit that thumbs up. Yeah, it's free. Doesn't cost you anything. Just big thumbs up. Thank you. Next, number seven, sequential circuits, profit five. It is credited as being the first fully programmable polyphonic synthesizer. This was achieved by using an onboard microprocessor, which for 1977 was pretty groundbreaking. As the title suggests, this analog synth has five voices, two oscillators, and a great sounding low pass filter. Don't believe me? Don't believe me, just watch!
yes, 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 yes. The Prophet 5 is the incarnation of what we all describe as warm, juicy, punchy, a punchy analog synthesizer. Yes, this is the OG of all polyphonic synths and it has been adopted globally by so many artists, including Genesis, Kraftwerk, David Bowie, Cool and the Gang, 6,000 units were ever manufactured until 1984 and the profit is still nowadays very sought after and quite expensive, I know, because I purchased one. Look at how I have played it before on this video. <laughs> Number six, Korg M1. With over 250,000 units sold, the Korg M1 is hands down the most popular synthesizer ever made, featuring a 16 voice PCM based sound engine and a lightweight plastic construction, this synth has 4 megs worth of samples, which were at the heart of those ultra famous 88 presets. Let's listen to a few of them. Yeah, I know there are so many famous ones. I'm gonna leave a link in the description for more of them. And unlike any other synthesizer of the time, the M1 had drum patches. I'm walking in the man in the mirror. Although editing was possible, this unit was more famous for its presets than for its other features. A bit like the D50, right? However, unlike the D50, the M1 had a relatively sophisticated 8-track sequencer capable of holding 10 songs and 100 patterns. From Shaggy's 1995 world hit Bombastic to Robin S. Show Me Love from the Queen's I'm Going Slightly Mad, which I've just played earlier, to the omnipresent house piano in 90s house music. The M1 is probably one of the most recorded synthesizers of its time. It was adopted by artists across all genres of music, including Joe Zavinel, In Excess, Robert Miles, Aerosmith, Pet Shop Boys, and the list goes on and on and on until you subscribe to this channel. There is a button right there. And also a bell notification bell button. Yes, yes, yes. Next. Number five, ARP 2600. This legendary monophonic analog synthesizer was first introduced in 1971 and it featured a semi-modular design which meant some of the basic modules were internally pre-wired so that they could be operated with or without patch cords. This may sound trivial unless you look at how synthesizers looked before the 2600. This synthesizer was extremely flexible and the modular nature of its layout allowed for some truly jaw-dropping sound design. This is a modern version of it called 2600M and it's slightly smaller, it's made by Korg and it sounds just like the original. <laughs> For this extreme flexibility, 
In creating sounds, the ARP2600 was selected to give voice to R2-D2 from Star Wars. <laughs> However, the ARP wasn't just a great noise maker, but also a very powerful musical instrument, one that Stevie Wonder would adopt immediately and subsequently sanctified with his 1972 hit, I Wish. Over the years, the ARP2600 was reincarnated a few times with different color schemes, but without significant changes in layout or sound. It has been used notably by Jean-Michel Jarre, Brian Eno, Joy Division, Pete Townsend and the Chemical Brothers. Next! Number 4. Yamaha CS80 This is one of the most amazing synthesizers that humanity has ever produced. It's an 8-voice, dual-layer, polyphonic analog synth with four hardwired memory patches polyphonic aftertouch, ribbon control, it weighs a ton and it sounds like a dream. I was inches away from acquiring one about four years ago. The price was £16,000 and I was pre-approved for a bank loan to get it. But at the very last minute, I chickened out. Chickened out, and now I regret it for the rest of my life. The CS80 is built like a fortress. It looks imposing and elegant, and it's a marvel of electronic engineering. Look at the internal wiring. It's mental. Imagine how long it would take to build one of these. In fact, only 2,000 were ever built. Michael Jackson himself played it on Billie Jean, and among the few lucky who have owned one of these, I mention Paul McCartney, Giorgio Moroder, Daft Punk, Toto, Steve Winwood, and even Square Pusher. Did I forget any famous owners of the CS80? Let me know in the comments here below if I have. Next. Number three. Yamaha DX7. This synthesizer is the undisputed king of the 80s. Digital, sharp, remorseless. This freak of technology is based on FM synthesis developed by John Chowning at Stanford University in California. Unlike all synths that came before it, the DX7 could sound glassy, breathy, metallic, heavy, nasty, oh yeah, but always with a distinctive, personal, unmistakable edge to it. I'm gonna play just one of the famous sounds here. Yes! The DX7 is on more 80s hits that you can count. Whitney Houston, Madonna, Michael Jackson, Phil Collins, AHA, Celine Dion, they all had multiple DX7 world hits. That's right! With over 200,000 units built between 1983 and 1989, the DX7 single-handedly put an end to the golden era of analog synthesizers and initiated the shift towards digital synth manufacturing. Number two, the Roland Jupiter 8. Considered by many the finest polyphonic analog synthesizer ever made, the Roland Jupiter 8 is certainly one of the fattest sounding and best looking. Produced between 1981 and 1985, the JP8 has two oscillators, eight voices, arpeggiator, self-tuning and balanced stereo out. Everything about this synth is exceptional. The feel of the keypad, the controls layout, build quality, but above all, it sounds as big as a house. The JP8 was the go-to polysynth for most of the top session players of the time, which means if you live through the 80s, then this is probably the synth that you have heard the most during that decade. 
there is no escaping the reach of the Roland Jupiter 8, as it was used by Marvin Gaye, Quincy Jones, Duran Duran, ABBA, George Duke, Rick Astley. Trust me, it's a big list. The Jupiter 8 remains one of the most coveted and expensive vintage synthesizers to buy. Fortunately, its legacy continues on with the Jupiter X, which sounds shockingly close to the original. Next and last, number one, the Minimog. Undoubtedly the most iconic synthesizer of all time. The Mini Mog is the successor of the much bigger and expensive Mog Modular. The goal of Bob Moog, arguably the man who started the synthesizer revolution, was to empower musicians with a small portable synth that would have less features but the same big sound as the Modular. By nurturing a genuine relationship with the musician's community, he was able to gather feedback and used it to come up with an instrument that was tailored to their needs. It was compact enough that you could take it on tour and it looked hot and it was easy to operate. Three oscillators, monophonic, hand-built, wood, metal, heavy plastic, it roared like a lion. This is mine. It's from 1972. I acquired it in 2019 after having dreamed of it for a lifetime. This is great for bass, obviously. Check out. But also for lead synths. All right, what do you think I've missed from this top 10 list? I would like to possibly make another one of these, but then what do I call it? And what synthesizers would I feature? Why don't you please leave me a comment in the comment section so that I get to know it. I hope you're doing super well. I hope you like this video and uh, keep on making great music. Synthesizers are great, music is awesome. Hope you're having a great day and I'll see you later. Well, after you've watched this video, obviously. Bye. Video. Bye. <laughs>